So prioritizing experiments is something that's a sort of a difficult skill and something that's absolutely critical to you know making progress in science. So it's absolutely the case that you know it takes a little bit of time to have a giant list of experiments that you're trying to weigh. But also this is sort of a, a protection that students have against their own mentors. So mentors have lots of lots of ideas, and they might throw them all at you, and they say, "Oh, you'd be a great idea to do experiment X, and it would be a great idea to do an experiment Y." And then you talk to them a day and a half later, and they say, "Oh my God, you know what's a wonderful idea is if we do this other experiment." So you might have a list of ten experiments that your advisor is excited about. So having some sort of idea of what you should spend your time doing is really, really important. I think the one guiding principle, no matter what experiment you're thinking about, is going back to the big picture question. Um, it's really easy to get off on a tangent and go follow something that's really uh, piques your curiosity. Um, and sometimes that will and sometimes that will not get you back towards your big picture questions. So having that sort of north star is really, really important. So that would be step one. But I think the other factors that go into deciding how to prioritize an experiment are um, feasibility and then also, you know, uh, having sort of availability of, of reagents and availability of technologies. When I'm thinking about feasibility and risk for when a student is designing um, an experiment, my first question is always, do we have the reagents to do that experiment? Do you need to generate those reagents? How long is that going to take? And will that actually answer the question that you're hoping to answer? Is there a way that you can answer this question, this complicated model that you've come up with? Are there predictions that this model makes with reagents we have? and that we can easily engineer into your strain of interest to be able to know whether or not it's worth doing that. Now, the caveat to that is, is that there are plenty of examples where somebody went whole hog, made the reagents, and it turned out to be right. I guess my issue will always be, how feasible is it in the organism you work in how effective you are at generating those reagents on your own? And is the time you spend generating those reagents worth your model being potentially wrong? And instead, should we evaluate if we can address your model with reagents we currently have? Or through another experiment that might not answer the question directly, but may answer the question obliquely so you know you're on the right path. So one thing that I tell students and postdocs always is to have sort of a small line of working experiments that they sort of know is going to work, that they know is going to make progress, and that all of these other experiments, some of them, you know, are really, really worth doing. You know, some of them are sort of um, high risk, high reward experiments. Some of them are, you know, um, experiments that really take long, a longer time to develop but ultimately will really get to your big picture question. And so um, you don't want to really just focus on incremental progress or really just focus on the big picture, but you want to have both of those things going at the same time. So um, a lot of that will depend on the tools you have available and the feasibility of the experiment. And so this is something that's really, really important in trying to um, decide which way you should go with an experiment, knowing that you have sort of a feasible um, set of experiments always going.